Welcome to A Therapist to Buddhist and You, brought to you by the Recovery Collective in Annapolis, Maryland. Thanks for taking the time as we explore a collective solution to all things health and wellness. I'm Luke Duboy, the therapist, and I'm joined by my co-host, Zal Mal, a Theraveda Buddhist meditation life and recovery coach. What's up, Zal? Hey, Luke. What's happening? So uh, be here. We, we're, we're back to the video, as a lot of you guys are listening on your preferred podcast platform. And if you'd like, feel free to check us out on YouTube as well. And you can find that in the episode notes as per usual. So together we'll navigate to the intersections of psychology, spirituality, health, and wellness, like usual, offering practical insights along the way. So thanks for tuning in. Connect with us and fellow listeners on social media platforms. All of them. <laughs> we got them. Our podcast thrives on a simple handshake agreement. We provide you with valuable tools and perspectives that can we believe transform your life. And in return, we ask for your support. Leave a like, a comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share a podcast with others who can benefit from our discussions. And just as all, we say this, like comment, subscribe every week. I'm not vain enough to care about the likes and comments, but the platforms do for the algorithm. So it's just one way for people to have more access to this podcast. So if you really could spend a, you know, a minute or two to comment or, and rate and like, and we'd really do appreciate it. Well, well, before we, before we get going, I'll, I'll say my two more things. If you're feeling particularly generous, uh, listeners out there, you can now appreciate, you can now uh, show your appreciation through our donate button. Every contribution helps and continue our mission of uncovering solutions to all things related to health and wellness. Remember it's through our collective efforts that we pave the way through a healthy healthier and more meaningful life. So as I'll ask you a question, have you ever wondered if there's a more to achieving holistic wellness than meets the eye, huh? What if I told you there, there's a health professional whose approach might just challenge your perspective on, on wellness. So we get ready to uncover a world of health and healing that might just challenge your preconceptions. So let's uh, bring on our distinguished guest. How about that, Zoll? Sounds great. Let's do All right. It. Dr. Eric Corzin, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for, for joining us. Me. So let me get, let me uh, toot your own horn for a second. He's a highly <laughs> respected chiropractor with a wealth of expertise in chiropractic care. Dr. Corzin, am I saying it right, Corzin? Yep. Yeah, that's okay, correct. That would, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. No, Corzin has a dedica uh, dedicated his career to helping individuals achieve optimal health and well-being through holistic and integrative approaches. With a deep commitment to patient care and a passion for promoting overall wellness, Dr. Corson brings a unique perspective to our discussion today. So once again, welcome, Dr. Corson. Thank you yeah. for having me. It's great. Thanks for joining us. And Dr. Corson focuses and specializes in, in being a chiropractor. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Specifically physical medicine. That's sort of the realm that I, uh, I typically specialize and spend most of my time in. Mm. So talk a little bit about that. How does being a chiropractor in physical medicine, how does that differ from quote unquote traditional um, medical practices? Yeah, um, I think chiropractors as a whole and chiropractors can actually like be a sort of a, a broader spectrum. You know, when we use the term chiropractor, you can you can really see a very diverse uh, group of professionals. Uh, so it depends on who you end up seeing. But the way I practice uh, tends to integrate more so into the allopathic field uh, than some other chiropractors do. So um, I got to stop you there. What's that? Allo. What allo. Allopathic. Tell us, what does that mean? Allopathic. So allopathic are our MD and DO colleagues. Right. So they are they are our our quote unquote traditional medical doctors and, and DOs, which are the doctors of osteopath, right? Mm -hmm. Um they are the ones that are doing the traditional medical training, medical residencies and surgeries and all of those subspecialties, right? Um so those are from the chiropractic standpoint, we refer to them as allopaths. Okay. Yeah. Very neat. Um so yeah, but chiropractic I think, again, as a whole, tends to have a, a more holistic view on health than the allopaths do. The allopaths tend to have a little bit more of a narrow-minded perspective 
partly because of their specialty and and you know at this point like this very super specialist thing that we're now creating right like we've gotten past just having an oncologist now you've got an oncologist that is pediatric oncologist an oncologist that does only you know renal cancers and things so we've we've gone past you know having these specialties and gone to these super specialists um I'm sure, you have a, I'm sure yeah. you have an opinion on that, but keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah I do. I do. But uh, yeah, chiropractors tend to have a, a, a more holistic view. Not that not that we can't have our specialties right as well, but we tend to view things from a broader perspective, mm-hmm. if that makes sense, a, a more of a bird's eye view when we when we evaluate and treat patients. So continue to break stereotypes, will you? Often we yeah. think of chiro- a chiropractor and spinal adjustments. Absolutely. Elaborate more on what you feel you do as a chiropractor and a, and the kind of doctor that you are. Yeah, I mean, I think chiropractors a lot of times get pigeonholed into being a backcracker, right? For lack of better words, we <laughs> crack people's backs, right? We crack spines. Uh, I look at what I do as if there is any neuromusculoskeletal condition, any, I can play a role in either evaluating or treating that condition. So we can look at things like carpal tunnel. We can look at things like tension headaches. We can look at things, um, peripheral neuropathies, like osteoarthritis, RA, uh, literally name something that impacts muscles, joints, nerves, all of that. And I can play a part in that. Um, so I think I think that's probably one of the bigger differences between just oh all I do is crack backs all day. No, that's not what I do. Mm-hmm. I can I can dive deeper into a, a more again holistic sort of evaluation and truly figure out like the root cause of what's happening. So I've got questions, but take us where you want to go based on what you're saying. Well, because... no, I'd love let's, let's go with your questions, Luke. I love it. Because where my mind goes is, okay, you're more yeah. than a, a backcracker. You you have the ability to help and and not just a subspecialty, very specific, hyper-focused way. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you often see people that come to you for back pain, and then mm-hmm. you wind up helping them in other fashions in other ways. Give us an example. I mean, and, and we do that at the Recovery Collective. Someone might see me for anxiety. And then they're seeing our, you know, the classical Chinese medicine, acupuncturist and or all for mindfulness, the holistic approach. So say someone sees you for back pain and I'll be curious how you help with back pain, but let's, let's go to this, this bigger perspective. Yeah, also to, to piggyback on that question too, a couple of the questions that's along those lines, but to be more specific to, from the point of view of wellness, uh, I do want to hear about your background, you know, how you, what, what drew you, uh, to this field? And also that question about holistic, uh, the way I understand is that, you know, when and why I should go see a particular practitioner, you know, but mm-hmm. the thing with holistic is that I don't need to wait for a problem to go see one, you know, but when I go, uh, it's already like something is properly placed, which builds a whole picture. So I wanted to know more about that too. Nothing should be preventing me from, or I, I don't need to wait for a particular moment to go see a chiropractor. So I wanted to add those two questions too, which are along the same lines. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll address yours first, then, Zah, just to uh, give some background. So I've been in practice a little over 10 years. Um, I have been a professor for about the same time as well. My my sort of like passion for teaching uh, comes from trying to help build up our profession and really advance and progress it forward. I want to teach the next generation and and really move forward. Uh, one of the, one of the topics I love to teach on is anatomy though. And I've spent a lot of time dissecting cadavers and teaching from both a lecture and a lab standpoint. Um, and I really love incorporating clinical aspects into how do we draw just basic anatomy into the actual clinical application of, of seeing patients. Right. Um, and it, it's so crucial for what we do, for what I do, especially as a chiropractor in the, in the, the bio biomechanical, physical medicine realm, you know, neuromusculoskeletal. I, I love getting into that. I dive into that stuff. Um, so that's kind of a background on me. But yes, so from a holistic standpoint, you don't need to wait for, you know, to have a flare up of something or to have an issue pop up to come see a chiropractor. You can see a chiropractor, be evaluated and make sure that essentially 
joints and muscles are functioning in optimal ways. We know how to look at that. At least good quality chiropractors know how to look at that and can help you process that. And then can also not only do things hands-on with you in the office, but good quality chiropractors should then also be able to give you exercises or educate you on self-care techniques that you can then use at home or on your own to reinforce things that we can do in the office too. Does that, does that help answer that question? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then Luke, you were asking about back pain, right? As an example, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a patient comes in with back pain. How else do I help them? Right. That was your question. Mm -hmm. yeah, I so, wanna, I'm glad Zoll slowed me down because this is good for the listener. Yeah. What, what sparked you to, to do this field? What, what That's a great question. Um, I actually went to, to college thinking I was going to become a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, to be totally like transparent, at the time, the state I was practicing in did not allow physical therapists direct access to patients. And I really struggled with having the autonomy to think for myself and be able to act on my own rather than just via a script from an orthopedist or a pain management doc or whoever. Um, so I started exploring options like how do I how do I use the knowledge that I'm going to develop and not have to just function underneath someone's authority and oversight all the time. Um, so that started leading me down different uh, explorations and I landed on chiropractic uh, mm -hmm. actually thanks to um, unfortunately uh, a, a late friend of mine uh, who's become my mentor. Aaron Wolf, he actually passed away this this Memorial weekend, but um, he was the first chiropractor I ever shadowed. I decided to go to the same school he went to um, because I just loved, again, his sort of like holistic viewpoint of how do we, how do we just help people? And and that's that was his whole thing. Like, it, it doesn't matter if you're a high school athlete or if you're a stay at home mom, like, how do I help you? Mm -hmm. So, so that's where that came from. Yeah, so you embody the holistic approach, but let's find out more about that. Someone comes to you for back pain, and then how do you help them find, explore the, the, all parts of health and wellness for them? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously, the first thing is, a, especially as a chiropractor, people typically are expecting to come to you and leave better than they felt walking in, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to then go through the process of evaluating, figuring out what's actually happening, what caused the back pain what makes it better, what makes it worse, et cetera, right? Um, and then do something in the office to help them. And then again, reinforce that outside the office. But through that process, a lot of times I can figure out, okay, well, if, you were, if you've got six kids that you're, you know, shuttling around to all these different activities and your stress levels are super high and there's other things maybe happening on, you know, in the background or whatever, there's different avenues that we can start to explore with like, Hey, I want you to go talk to a therapist. I want you to go do acupuncture. I, I need you to get a, a big one that I talk about a lot is sleep. Patients a lot of times lack quality sleep. And there are times they're like, Hey, what position should I sleep in? Or what should I do? And there's times I just tell patients, I don't care. I just <laughs> want you to get good sleep for right now. We can talk about sleep positions. We can talk about, you know, different stressors and things, but for right now, I just want you to get good quality sleep. Um, so those are different avenues as sort of like a generic that I typically talk about with a lot of patients. What do you think, Zoe? Yeah, lower back pain, you know, that, that, that spoke <laughs> to me. And from the point of view of holistic too, I have limited experience with uh, chiropractors as a, as a client, but I did have a recurring theme in my life where lower back pain comes along with stress, you know, when there is like financial related, emotional related and uh, so it, it got me thinking about that. Wanted to ask you to where, how common, I feel like it's a common problem for many people, lower back pain. Also, what's your take on that mind-body connection that like when there is a back pain, it's like a manifestation of some kind of a stress or emotional related, mental, you know, well-being related. Has that been your experience as well? Ab absolutely. Um, as, as you're talking, one of a patient from this week actually comes to mind. So there's a patient that was actually uh, having some back pain after a car accident. And I saw her and, she, you know, pain scales were, you know, she was a seven to eight out of 10 on the pain scale, which is pretty darn high, um, especially because it was weeks after the incident. Right. And so <clears throat> I saw her and then she she felt better after I saw her. And then she came in a week later and she comes in and she's like, 
you know what? I had no pain after I saw you until I drove past the intersection where that ac- mm. where that accident occurred. So as you're talking about that, Zal, that that was one of the one of the patients this week actually that you know pops up of she literally has that mind body connection of her pain literally started the minute she drove to that intersection and she told me she made a turn around the corner and then her pain went away. So mm-hmm. she has that you know traumatic experience that now triggers it every single time. So she has told me, she shared with me last time I saw her, she actually tries to avoid that route. Um, so that way she doesn't trigger this because when she was in the office recently to see me, she felt great. She was totally fine. The only as time a, she gets that pain is with that. As a therapist, my my bells are going off, right? And you, right. you use the word trauma and yeah, yeah, it's the mind body connection is huge. Um, yeah. So no, I, I, Absolutely agree with that. Yeah. It's all that there's a huge mind body and we, we see it all the time, especially, especially, you know, this is the person I'm talking about right now is more of an acute situation because of the car accident. But when we start to get into patients that deal with chronic pain, chronic yeah. pain is such, such a huge topic when it comes to, you know, the biopsychosocial experiences that people bring to the table when you're, when you're treating them. So chronic pain is just so complicated. Uh, I'm, yeah, along along with that too, are there also like uh, characteristics of a client who either, uh, in terms of like mindset where they're at, uh, either can make the process more efficient and uh, speedy, or uh, characteristics that can like kind of slow down the process based on like where where they're at and how resistant or how willing they are in a way. Absolutely, yeah. And one of the one of the big things is does a patient want to get better? That is honestly one of the things, and and that's one of the factors when I evaluate a patient that I can almost, I don't want to say instantly, but on most patients, I have a fairly good read on in that first session of, do they actually want to get better or do they want me to just fix them? Right. Cause a lot of people come to practitioners with the mentality of, well, you're the doctor, you're the one with the experience, the training, all of that, you fix me versus the concept of how do I take ownership for my own health? And yeah, I'm here, I'm the doctor, I can guide you along that process, but really ultimately this is on you. I can provide you, you know, steps to take all of the guidelines that you may need to kind of get to the point where you would like to go, but it's not on me, it's on you, right? So, and that that is a difficult sort of conversation depending on the patient. You have to, you know, read that situation carefully. One of the big, one of the, probably one of the biggest problems that I see with a lot of the patients um, that I have is diagnostic imaging. So I'll, I'll expand on that diagnostic imaging in the sense of x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, you name it, right? Ultrasounds, whatever. A lot of times patients will get these procedures done and they'll, they'll cling to a diagnosis. They will then identify themselves as a diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. So they will no longer be a patient with low back pain. They'll be oh, I have an L4, L5 disc herniation. And that is just mentally, that is what they associate themselves with. And that's how they identify themselves. And then they thus define all of these episodes of back pain based on, well, I have a disc. And they just write it off as, I have a disc, I have a disc, I have a disc. Um, And that can be really problematic because then we go through these episodic flare-ups and they've never really learned how to deal with it beyond just identifying as as that. Yeah, the way I explain it, and I, we have the same philosophy. It's the difference between treatment and recovery. You, you can treat someone, you can treat a diagnosis, but where is the insight? Where's the action? Where's the change? Where's the responsibility? And, and empowering them to, whether it's get to the underlying causes and conditions or to make these changes that are necessary for an actual change past the diagnosis. Yeah. Exactly. So talk more yeah. about chronic pain for us, will you? We, uh, well, there's therapists yeah. that specialize in it. There's chiropractors that see a lot of people with chronic pain. So tell us more about that. Yeah. Chronic pain is, is a really difficult, um, really difficult group of patients to treat. Um, not in the sense that I don't enjoy treating them cause I do. Um, but it's difficult sometimes to get a handle on what we just talked about of can, can we truly make a difference and impact them um, versus doing what they've seen with potentially 10 other providers in the past where it's just like they, they see them and they kind of just get pushed, 
you know, push through the, um, push through the mill, if you will. Um, so, and I think one of the things with chronic pain, um, again, if I see patients with chronic pain situations, I typically prefer to have them treated in a multidisciplinary approach as well. I will a hundred percent not claim that I can handle and manage all of their comorbidities. There is just, mm -hmm. there's too much happening there, right? Um, whether it's a biomechanical thing or if it's a um, psychological or emotional situation, I simply cannot handle all of that. I, you know, uh, and, and I think that's one of the cool things about healthcare though, too, at this point, right? That we have the ability for me to do what I do really well and do physical medicine, but also recognize my limitations and know that there's other folks out there that are really good at what they do. Right. And then I develop that network to go, okay, this is, I'm not a therapist, right. And then <laughs> a counselor or psychologist, anything along those lines, but I can connect with you and then get you to the people that you need to. Hey, part of the reason is why you're on today after we we've had a, a handful of conversations it's a collective solution to health and wellness yeah it's it's the example of the primary care doctor and someone has blood pressure through mm -hmm. the, through the roof and yes you could give a medication to fix the diagnosis momentarily but yeah. there's other things that could have a positive effect on decreasing the blood pressure anxiety stress physical health nutrition b body connection, all those things can have just a, a multidisciplinary approach. Absolutely. And yeah, I imagine uh, <laughs> it's the same thing for me dealing with maybe potentially a chronic pain client. If they saw you and I at the same time, that's a, that might help the individual multidisciplinary approach. Absolutely. You're not a subspecialist in just chronic back pain. That'd probably be really bad in your situation. Yeah. Yeah, it would. It would. <laughs> What about all those rotator cuffs I need to see? And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Plantar fasciitis and all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. But the ability to go, oh, you can still look at this in different realms and perspectives to help the healing process and change the change it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is there also any aspect of, um, for lack of a better word, like education or educating the client? Since you mentioned about anatomy, how passionate you are. Uh, and I, I've been thinking about that too, that our, our body is so complex and there are just so many parts that I wasn't aware of, but like only if my liver is feeling, I need to learn about liver kind of situation. It doesn't have to be that way, you know? So like I started doing yoga recently and I'm just learning more about like where things are and how things are aligned and stuff like that. Like there's so much freedom in, in that awareness when you become, when we become aware of it. So are there, uh, in your experience too, where people, you know, learn more about their own anatomy, you know, by seeing a chiropractor and then benefiting uh, from that. Yeah, they do. Actually, that's one of my favorite things is when I see that light bulb go on for patients, whether it's from me, uh, you know, palpating or showing them, honestly, that that's probably my favorite thing to do is when I can actually demonstrate and show them. So one of the things I like to do, I like to assess something, treat it and then reassess it. So that way, not only for myself, from like a clinical standpoint, is that really valuable information, obviously, to know if what I'm doing is actually making an impact. But also from a patient standpoint, there's that education or that buy-in piece, if you will, of like, oh, shoot, this is actually changing or doing something different, right? So for example, um, I may watch, watch somebody do like an overhead squat where they put their arms overhead and they squat, right? And then I may pick up on some deficits or dysfunction, maybe even some pain that they're dealing with. I'll go and treat them, do something, have them do an overhead squat again. And most often they see something almost immediately change, whether it's pain or like, oh, wow, my hip has more free range of motion, whatever it is. Um, so there's a huge educational component to actually showing patients how this applies to whatever they're dealing with, you know? So yeah, to your point, Zal, like I, I take patients through yoga exercises all the time and I honestly, what I, what I like to do with those is I like to put them on the floor and say, show me what you're doing. And I don't, I don't critique them. I don't do anything. I literally just start out initially with, okay, you say, you know how to do even something, you, you know how to do child's pose, something really basic, right? Show me how you're doing child's pose. And probably six out of 10 times they're doing something that for them specifically 
might not be the most ideal position or movement for themselves. Now, it's not bad, but for whatever condition I might be treating or walking them through, they may need a tweak or a modification that I might be able to identify because no one's actually taking the time to sit there and go like, hey, that for your condition isn't great. So let's let's modify this or tweak this or maybe not sink into it as deep, right? Like there's some things that we can do. So I love doing that part of, yeah, show me what you're doing right now and how can we how can we tweak that? Because I'm a big proponent of movement. I don't want patients, I very rarely tell patients to rest, very rarely, right? There's an acute ankle sprain, okay, fine. We gotta rest a little bit, right? That, that's one thing. But for the most part, I tell patients motion is lotion. We gotta get your joints moving. We gotta get the muscles moving. Everything needs to move in conjunction. So, but we need to do it in the right way and in, in, in an appropriate directed guided way. And that's, that's again, where I come into play as far as like, how do I educate you on the movements you need to be doing in which directions, how frequently all of those things. Right. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of let's, let's keep you moving, but let's do it the right way. When you actually tweak or modify something, what is the belief system when you do that? Um, initially, most often it's to, it's to help, um, help mitigate pain most often. So, uh, an example I like to use is, um, someone with a uh, lumbar disc herniation, people with lumbar disc herniations tend to, and this is just literally based on statistics. It's like over 80% of patients with lumbar disc herniations feel more symptoms when they flex or when they bend forward than they do when they extend. So based on that concept, and of course, there's other ways to test this. Based on that concept, what I'll do is I'll have someone show me how they're doing a child's pose, how they're doing Cobra, and I will tweak and modify that mainly for pain initially. But I also use that later on to get them through the fear avoidance stage, because once we get out of this acute pain or whatever situation they're feeling, a lot of times patients are like, well, you know, I have a disc, so I can't ever bend forward. Well, no, a healthy spine, a healthy body, you should be able to bend at some point. I'm not saying you can't ever bend, right? So we need to work towards like, let's tweak it initially, and then let's test it later on down the road and make sure that you can flex and make sure child's pose does feel okay, that you can move into there. Because once your tissues are healthier, you should be able to push them in certain directions and not cause flare ups. And in that case, are you literally moving the vertebrae? What are you doing to make the pain alleviate in that example, lower back L4, L5? Yeah. So like a lumbar disc herniation, um, you know, that example, when you go into extension, the pressure that gets put on the disc posteriorly actually forces the herniation anteriorly away from the nerve roots that it's potentially impacting. Whereas if you flex, it forces it posteriorly and you end up hitting the nerve roots again. So initially with a, you know, a disc herniation or a disc bulge, as a lot of people refer to them, disc bulges, they typically, again, respond better to extension. So initially I'll put them into extension and I'll, I'll press, I'll have them do Cobra moves while I'm pressing. Um, there's various techniques. Sometimes I adjust them, sometimes I don't. Um, and that's again, you know, patient dependent. So, so you're, you're adjusting the spine, you're adjusting the vertebrae in that circumstance, potentially. Yeah. Help, help, gotcha. yeah helping the joints, uh, joints. move better. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of schools of thoughts there, Luke, about, about chiropractors. Give it to moving. us. Yeah. Give it to us. There's a couple you got school, it. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of schools of thought there on, um, chiropractors and, and what we actually do. So the, the, oh, this is, so the two ends of the spectrum, right, are the, what they're called the straights, okay? And the straights refer to nothing other than they come straight from the philosophy of chiropractic, which is we adjust the vertebrae. We move the vertebrae okay. and there is a whole host of uh, potential benefits that we may be able to see. The difficult part with that is some of it is well documented and some of it is not. And, you know, for myself, being very science oriented, evidence based, right? I want to be able to see some evidence and some like research behind what we're doing. So you've got the straights on one side that have a lot of, I would say, anecdotal evidence that what they do is beneficial. And I'm not mm -hmm. taking that away because there are there's a lot out there on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then you have what's called the mixers on the other side. And the mixers combine the concept of the holistic chiropractic philosophy and evidence or research and science into that. So that's where we start to look at. And what I talk about with patients is when I perform an adjustment, I'm not putting bones back into place. I'm helping joints move better. And by helping the joints move better, there's three things I focus on. Reduction in pain, increased range of motion, and reduce muscle hypertonicity, reducing muscle spasms locally in the area. And those are three things that I feel totally comfortable saying because they are backed up by research. We know that when a, an adjustment is performed, those th three things can happen, at least in the short term. And again, that's where like I can do something in the office, I can adjust you. That's a short term effect. How do I teach you to do something outside of the office to reinforce what I just did in the office? That's where the education component, exercise, et cetera. So often I, I think often people get frustrated because you call them the, the straighters. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny yeah. that, Hey, you come in, you put on a heat pad. I'm, I'm going to treat you like a number. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Crack your back. Okay. Go. That's it. Oh, okay. And not have the teaching education. Well, how long is this going to happen for, or what the, the art of a teacher? Right. I mean, yeah. that's to me the difference where I think some people get frustrated with. Yeah. And, and honestly, for, for a patient or a consumer that doesn't know anything about chiropractic, they'd have no clue. Again, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I talked about initially when we opened this conversation was you could go into any number of chiropractic offices and have a very different experience because you don't know what you're walking into. Right. Um, and, and that, yeah, that, that, that part is just so crucial. And, it's funny because being in the chiropractic world now, both being a student myself and now being a professor, I've seen like this whole sort of like um, I, spectrum of, of, of chiropractors. But in our field, we have something called the flying seven, which like Luke, what you're talking about is a patient being treated like they're running through the mill. This is, this is the flying seven. So chiropractors call it the flying seven because it's, uh, cervical adjustment. So a neck adjustment on the left, on the right, which is two, you get three thoracic adjustments and then mm -hmm. a low back adjustment left and right. And you end up with seven and they literally do the same exact thing for every single patient. Mm. Yeah. Uh, this is not how I practice, yeah. but I, I know but it, cookie it cutter. A, it's the, yes, it, yeah. it is a very, very common. I mean, you mm -hmm. will literally see it in thousands of chiropractic offices around this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. But it's funny because, again, unless I had told you about that, you'd never – no one knows about that sure. until we start getting it out there that yeah. this is something that is actually, like, fairly common practice. Mm -hmm. so. so in terms of, uh, you know, making the problem go away or reducing the pain, but also, like, uh, maintenance, other things uh, that you suggest, or uh, is there, like, a particular frequency after – afterwards or exercise that they, that they can do or some kind of dietary uh, suggestions as well in terms of like holistic how yeah how expand how, how much does it expand oh yeah i mean you know uh, from a holistic standpoint i feel like the sky's the limit right like we can mm -hmm. we can get into so much um from my standpoint though from a chiropractic you know viewpoint that that focuses on on this bioma biomechanical and, and pain management and physical medicine realm Typically, once I see patients get through pain and we get through episodes, um, I will usually give them essentially like a two week trial run where they don't see me and they are supposed to be doing the things that I taught them. And after two weeks, they come back in, they see me and we do a check in. Um, I may adjust them at that point, may tweak some exercises again and teach them how to do different things. Um, and then I typically, as long as things, as long as their presentation is moving in a positive direction, I will then give them a month where they had, don't have an interaction with me unless they have a flare up. And of course I talked to them about that, but I, I like to have patients live their lives without me intervening because if they're dependent on me all the time, it, it it's not helpful for their overall health, right? I need them again. This goes back to that ownership piece of like, they need to take ownership of their health. I can guide them through that process, but I want them to take ownership of that. So is an example of the biomechanical and physical medicine that you would get to a point where it would be appropriate to teach them how to strengthen muscle imbalances? What would be some examples? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So typically I start off with 
more of what I would call stretching or mobility exercises, right? How do we lengthen muscles? How do we make sure joints are moving better? And then from there, we focus exercises on more stability and strengthening exercises. So there's sort of this pyramid that we build upon, right? Like we lay the foundation that joints can move in the correct planes and in the, in with the right amount of degrees that they need. And then we build upon that. And then we build upon that. And then we build upon that. Um, and really the yeah. ultimate sort of like, oh my gosh, we got there is more complicated, multi-joint, multi-planar movements, right? Like if somebody mm -hmm. can do, you know, um, an overhead squat with, with like, with like a press overhead and then do like a trunk rotation of some kind, like they literally just hit every joint in their body. And that's mm -hmm. awesome. Like, so it, it's that kind of like, how do I take them, you know, baby steps through this process? So I know there's, there's at least one or two or a handful of listeners that are going, okay, how long, and I know it's not cookie cutter. Yeah. How long does it quote unquote typically take to get to that point? For the, uh -huh. for the individual that isn't just being treated, that is <laughs> doing functionality, that is taking action in their recovery to get to that point of strengthening the muscles and, and taking responsibility for their part. Yeah, usually I would say, and again, you know, Luke, this is, this varies depending on the, on the condition and the patient. Probably huge, and whole, huge variance. Yeah, 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 a huge variance, right? I mean, their age, their, you know, their uh, functionality prior to whatever they're having, you know, a lot of things factor into this. Um, I would say probably with me, 10 sessions or less is I think usually that surprised a lot of people there to be honest yeah, with you. It, yeah. And honestly, it probably does because uh, again, a lot of your quote unquote traditional chiropractors will see patients for, you know, 10 times that amount, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so it, it's, it's a very different um, viewpoint as to how we can actually practice. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? So, though? yeah, I'm thinking about uh, what was, well, I'm thinking about this cheesy uh, statement, which got me thinking about the Chinese proverb or one of the proverb about, uh, you know, if you want to, the difference between uh, giving somebody a fish and then teaching them how to fish kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like that's very important. Uh, that's also the education part that you mentioned. That's also how we help client at Recovery Collective as well. You know, we come in, which is also what 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 you like, what I like about what you said about the willingness has to come from the patient. That do you really want to get better? You know, if that's the case, we'll give you mm -hmm. tools. But long term, you need to take ownership for your own health uh, instead of being dependent. You know, so th that's also what I'm hearing uh, from you about you know, educating them, giving them exercises. You can come back when you need, but essentially you're on the track now, you know, you're back, you're, you found a new path or you're back on track to get better. That's, uh, yeah, that's exactly. Cool and, yeah. and I feel like I want patients to know that I am here for them. Like, you know, once we get you back on track and things are going great and you've tested things and, you know, you can, let's say your goal is to run a marathon and you've run six of them. Great. That's awesome. But I want you to know that if something does come up in the future that I am the person that you can come back to, that you can trust, that you know that we can then move forward again if we need to restart care or do something, right? Like I, I want patients to have that level of trust and comfort with me that they know that I, I will take care of them and I'll guide them through this process again, you know? You know, speaking of trust and comfort, safety is obviously paramount in any form of health care. Mm -hmm. What are some contraindications or some red flags where you would go not right now yeah um that's a great question luke because i think unfortunately the media has done um a somewhat of a disservice or some damage to the chiropractic profession uh when it talks about some of these very rare instances of serious complications from chiropractic care um, probably most notably our stroke, right? That's probably the most common thing that folks are afraid of. And like any medical procedure, I don't care if you're going to your primary care doctor and getting prescribed a medication, or if you're going to an acupuncturist and getting needling done or seeing a chiropractor, there is inherent risk in anything. So when you look at the research and the studies on, on these risks for complications from chiropractors, they're extremely, extremely low. Um, the most recent study that was out there showed that 
patients that are having or are, are likely going to have a stroke have as much chance of having that stroke sitting in their primary care office as they do sitting with me in my office as a chiropractor. And that is mainly because the stroke is already occurring or. Uh, yeah. So, but so a chiropractor. I'm trying to see how like affecting the spine can be an adverse effect for a stroke. Help me yeah. out here. <laughs> yeah. So um, forceful manipulation to the okay. spine can impact the arteries that run through the neck and into okay. the skull. Okay. So if there is a stroke that's occurring, sometimes due to what's called a, an arterial dissection, meaning the arterial walls are separating, mm -hmm. you can have that separation occur, a blood clot will form, you can have the adjustment occur from a chiropractor, which will, you know, sort of finish off the dissection of the artery, gotcha. and that can then send the clot further into the brain causing a stroke. Sure. Makes sense. So, but again, when you look at that research, it, there's really no difference between sitting in my office or sitting in a primary care office because yeah. most often it's going to happen regardless. How could you pinpoint it to that? Yeah. As being yeah. the cause. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. And that's the, that's the problem is that how do we, how do we actually label that as a causative, you know, event or factor? Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, you can't, for the most part, mm -hmm. you can't. Uh, now, these are things that I talk about with patients, right? Like there's, there's, again, there's inherent risk in any medical procedure. I don't care what it is. There's mm -hmm. risk in everything. Um, you know, infection with acupuncture, it, it's a risk, it, mm -hmm. like super minimal, very, very low, but it's a potential, mm -hmm. right? Like it could happen. Um, so, so there's, there's conversations that you need to have with patients, but I think when it comes to a good evaluation, for the most part, I won't adjust somebody just to a adjust them. I, I will more often than not be very cautious with my care versus the opposite and being overly aggressive with my care. Mm -hmm. And there's certain screening methods we can use, right? But for the most part, we need to do a good physical evaluation, take a good history, and then we can make some determination of, of whether or not, you know, I've sent patients out for ultrasounds on their carotid arteries to make sure they're, you know, they don't have plaque building up. Like, because I've caught some of those where I'm glad I did because now they're on medications with their primary care doc. And now we're, you know, managing that together, but I am a hundred percent not adjusting their neck because I could take one of those plaques and sure. send it, send it upward. And that's not what I want to do. Right. So I do other things with them. I do stretches. I teach them how to do stretches. I do some soft tissue work. We can, we can do other things. We don't have to just, again, that goes back to what we talked about, right? Chiropractors are not just backcrackers. I can do a yeah. lot more than just that. Yeah. So sometimes doctors with pain or chronic pain can get a little uh, trigger happy with x-rays and things like that. Mm -hmm. What is your philosophy on doing x-rays? So my philosophy on x-rays is unless there is a red flag immediately, you know, and red flags can be um, uh, depending on what you look at patient's age, um, uh, recent trauma, infection, you know, past medical history of cancer or some other like conditions or diseases that they've been diagnosed with in the past, right? There are situations I send people off for x-rays almost immediately. For mm -hmm. the most part, I would say 80% of the time, if not more, for the most part, I treat patients for two weeks conservatively before I consider imaging. So That's what would you, pretty typical. you've got some listeners going, well, not my chiropractor. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, yeah. What, yeah. what would you tell the consumer that, you know, now being be more open to seeing a chiropractor that goes to someone and says, all right, well, let's do x-rays. What would be some good questions that you would recommend that they ask? My, or... yeah, yeah. From a patient standpoint, I would, I would ask the question of why, what are we, what, how is this going to impact the treatment plan that you're going to provide for me? Mm -hmm. That's what I would want to know because mm -hmm. It's the, it's, the, it's the same conversation I have when I send patients out for x-rays. If I send you out for an x-ray or an MRI or something, I'm expecting to find something. I'm not just going to x-ray you to x-ray you to see structurally what's happening. I'm expecting to find something that is going to change our treatment plan. And that's not a fun conversation to have, but there's a reason and a necessity for it, right? Versus yeah. these, it, it's not used as a screening method, I guess is the best way. I can put that hmm. right. I'm going to use a car analogy and I don't know cars. Yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> my, do it. My, 
my wife's Prius is a very old Prius. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have to see if it's worth it. So when we took the, uh, the car in and they wanted to do X amount of dollars and I said, okay, why? Well, I don't, I know I don't know why. So what are you trying to find out by doing the, this synopsis? I know you don't yeah. know what it's going to be, but I want to know why you're thinking and what, do you, what could you potentially find that goes, this is worth checking into. Because if not, I don't, for my car, I don't want to spend thousands of dollars and it's not worth that. <laughs> it's yeah. an older Prius. I think that can be with any type of diagnoses when it comes to x-rays, MRIs, things, like, and especially with chronic pain and, and we see with a lot of doctor, doctor's offices. Yeah, absolutely. Is that a fair, a fair analogy? Yeah. yeah, no, it is. It totally <laughs> is. Yeah. I mean, let's use cars. Yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a fair analogy. And again, I think that's where let's not use x-rays as a screening tool, but uh, as, rather as a diagnostic, you know, I, if that's I, a if better I way need of saying to, it, yeah, if I need to find a diagnostic reason to, you know, do x-rays and let's do that. But um, a lot of times chiropractors will do x-rays as a screening tool and, and, it sounds bad. They almost use it as a scare tactic as well. You know, yes. they, they, they throw a film up and nowadays we don't have film back when I graduated, we actually process things in dark rooms, mm -hmm. but now it's all digital, right? So mm -hmm. they throw films up and they show you, Oh my gosh, you have this curvature that you're lacking in your neck and you should really have this curvature. Well, is that inaccurate? No, but is that the cause of your problem? Is that what's actually contributing to the situation that you're coming in with? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and at the same time, again, nothing against imaging or diagnosis uh, with MRIs or CTs or x-rays, but they are static images of moving body parts. So it is a piece of the puzzle. It is not everything. Mm -hmm. So even when patients come into me with an MRI and they're like, well, clearly I have a lumbar disc herniation. You can see it on the MRI. That doesn't mean that's your generator of pain. It means we found something on an image. That doesn't mean that's a pain generator for you you could have pain coming from elsewhere and you are just locked into the fact that that's on the imaging report or whatever. So that's something I tell patients, like we need to be cautious with, I'm all for getting diag diagnostics done if we need to, but it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not everything. Yeah. I really value this conversation. Uh, I'm a firm believer about this concept of, you know, inner knowing or intuitive awareness in a way like our body's always giving us signals, you know, when mm -hmm. something's not right, but then we also have a tendency to either ignore it or get busy, you know? So like, there's something very powerful about, because I've experienced it myself too, that how much I'm missing out on life because of a pain, you know? But then yeah. mm -hmm. our brain acclimates to it, which which is sad because, but then once that pain is relieved, you, you enjoy life so much, you know? So many doors open up. It's also as a result of like me not giving attention to what my body's signaling, you know? And I can just go as far as that. But if I get too attached to a diagnostic, I'm not listening to my body, but I'm listening to the image, you know, where it's, it's all about like knowing and listening to our body and then taking appropriate action. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you bring up a really great point there too, Zal, is that there are some patients that are really, really good at listening to their bodies. And there are some patients that have no clue what their bodies are telling them. You know, it's, it's, it's really funny, especially from, from my standpoint of I'll tell a patient like, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, show me this exercise, like a, a bent over row or whatever. And I see it and I'm like, what are you doing? And then I'm like, okay, you need to, you need to drop your shoulder, make sure you're not doing this, tuck in your, up, whatever it is. And then I tell them to do those things. I demonstrate it for them. And then they do it again. And it's the same. And I'm like, you have no clue what your body's doing in space. Like you're mm -hmm. such, there's such a disconnect here between your body and, and what you said, like that, that intuition you have with your, with your own body is, is a huge component. And that's true with physical. That's true with emotions. That's true. Absolutely. With yeah. Behaviors. I mean, that's something that holds true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, across, yeah. Across all disciplines. Yeah. That's right. Where, where would you like, chiropractic care to fit in the broader landscape of healthcare? Where would you like it to be? That's such a loaded question. Like, <laughs> um, well, we dive deep. So I know. No, I I love it. no, it's good. It's good. Um, I think, I think one of the biggest things for me, again, I would love to dispel the, the, the myth or the connotation that chiropractors just crack backs. I, I would love to have the chiropractic profession be 
a respected profession versus what I, so I differentiate chiropractors a couple different ways. One of them being like, if you just adjust backs, in my opinion, you're not really a doctor, you're a technician. You, hmm. I, I can teach my wife to adjust somebody's back, hmm. right? She will not, however, have the diagnostic skills and the, like the physician qualities that I have, which is when to adjust, when not to adjust, how to adjust all those red flags of diagnosis and referring out mm -hmm. and tweaking things, right? She doesn't have any of that. Um, so there's a difference there in being a technician and just being able to do a flying seven. It, I could teach you to do that tomorrow. Yeah. It's not that big a deal, right? Yeah. It's the other clinical component to that. So I would love to see that our profession as a whole move move towards uh, something beyond just a backcracker, move towards a, a more holistic minded, but still bringing that evidence component into how we practice and being able to fit in with all of the other providers that are out there too. You got me thinking, it, it sounds like there can be, I don't know how deep in philosophy we're going to go here or mm -hmm. um, what the science says. Yeah. It sounds like your form of chiropractic care can be proactive. What does that look like? How, how many people see you? Oh, I, I don't have any pain, but I think that whether it's spinal alignment or I don't, maybe you can help me out with this question. Can chiropractic be a proactive form of treatment? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I have patients that see me that are not in pain that are just, they go, you know what? I, I tend to, let's put it this way. I don't have low back pain episodes when I see you regularly, when I'm proactively seeking you for care, I don't have my flare ups that are like eight out of 10 on the pain scale, debilitating low back pain or neck pain or headaches or what have you. I don't have those episodes when I am proactively doing things about it. Right. So it, there's a hundred percent. Yes. Let's, let's do some, let's do some proactive care there. There's, there's a huge component. What so. else are you thinking, Zoe? I think Zoe's really enjoying this conversation. <laughs> I, yeah, really. I'm also thinking about, you know, from the point of view of mindfulness as well about, you know, how, how much, again, that intuitive awareness, you know, that the thing about anatomy and there are also some specific meditation uh, practices in our tradition where you meditate on the 32 parts of the body where bones is involved, you know, muscles, tendons are involved too, where you just be present with those. And it, it can be, it can have very liberating effect, you know, because again, like we embody our bodies all our life. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes without knowing what's happening, you know, and then we die. <laughs> so it's, it's a beautiful thing to become aware of it. And then the conversations open up, you know, when we see a practitioner like you that, oh, this is the part where I haven't been paying attention to. Now I'm paying attention because of pain, you know? And uh, yeah, I don't know. There is just so much uh, that is, we, we take for granted when we're not in pain, you know, which is yeah. only what I realize when I'm in pain because uh, it's it's a very complex and sophisticated uh, mechanism that we embody, which is beautiful, but also a lot is being missed out. Yeah. And you talking about that all makes me think of how I love incorporating acupuncture because a lot of, you know, like you talked about meditation with, with bones and muscles and ligaments and there's a huge component to acupuncture when you look at all the different meridians and master points and things that that acupuncturists do that are focused on ten, tendons and sinews as they refer to them um and you know low back pain and sciatica and all of these all of these components that they can that they can focus on so um i may have to do some digging into the meditation part too because i've i haven't really gone into that realm myself with patients but that could absolutely be an added uh added benefit yeah, when you're talking about lab uh, early in your school year, it made me think of uh, this is not really practiced that much anymore. But in, in the past, in the ancient time or in the village, uh, when there's a dead body, they just send it to the monastery where they look at the body and then meditate, you know, which is kind mm -hmm. of scary. But that's also part of the process where you cut the body and then meditate. And the meditation part is that to kind of value your body, that you're alive, but also this is where you end up, but also becoming very specific about what's there and what's not there, which is kind of scary. I've never done it, but I've heard about that. That dead body is sent to the monks and they just look yeah. at it and then contemplate. Oh my Dr. gosh. Dr. Seeing... spent some time doing cadaver workshops. I was, so. was going to say, seeing some monks do some dissection would be real interesting. 
Um, <laughs> I doubt they would do it in a, uh, you know, stainless steel, uh, sterile environment sort of thing, but <laughs> pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, I mean, there, there is, you know, there's a huge component there, I think too, for, like you said, appreciating that, you know, you being alive and that this person, you know, it has now passed and, and being able to learn from them. Like yeah, all of my patients are all my students, I should say, all my students that come into the cadaver lab, you know, I really focus and impress upon them how grateful they should be and how much respect they should have for the individuals that we actually get to dissect and learn from, because, you know, the, the sacrifice, if you will, of donating their body to science to help the rest of us learn is is a huge sacrifice. And it's we should. We should have immense respect for that. I mean, there's no more beautiful puzzle than the human body. It's amazing how it all connects and works together in some way. It, it really is. And, yeah. and, you know, for as much as we think we know, we still don't know a lot. There is yeah. still a lot of unexplored things and things that we're like, we think we know that mechanism, but we don't know that mechanism. Mm -hmm. There's still a well, lot thank, out there. Thank you, Dr. Corzin, for sharing the things that you do know with us today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. This has been awesome. Yeah, it's yeah been thank a you. lot of fun. this conversation. So much, yeah. And thank you for shedding light on the world of chiropractic care. Your insights into the benefits, debunking myths, and identifying potential limitations have been valuable. As we continue our journey towards collective health and wellness, it's essential to explore various health care options. Listeners, we hope you found this episode enlightening and informative. And remember, understanding and exploring different modalities in healthcare empower us to make informed decisions about our well being. As always, we encourage you to connect with us on all the social media platforms. And Dr. Corzin, where can they, can they find you? What's a good, uh, I can put it um, on the, the episode notes, but. I was going to say, we can, put, we can put some things in the episode notes too. But yeah, you can find me on, on Instagram, um, Eric Corzin. Um, e R I K K O R Z E N is how you spell that. Um, you can find me there. Feel free to Google me too. Um, I'm sure you'll find some very old pictures of me from like chiropractic <laughs> school. Um, but yeah, feel free to Google me and yeah, let's put some things in the, in the video notes so that oh, way absolutely. they can, they can, um, connect with me for your practice as well. And he's in the sure. Anne Arundel County area as well. So, yep. well, thank you everyone. And for, see you next time for another exciting topic. My name's Luke. And this is Zah. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks.